Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our board meeting. Uh, before we get into our celebrations, we have a few things to open the meeting. Uh, we'll start with roll call, please. Here? Here. 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 If you can all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for the nation. We need to approve the agenda for the evening. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Been motioned and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. And the approval of the minutes from the March uh, 2nd and April 10th executive session. Uh, do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Motion and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. And the superintendent's report, Dr. Sprung. Thank you, uh, President Paragon and governing board members. Here we go, Butch. All right. Vista del Sur student Keely Lotz was selected as an Uvalde Foundation for Kids Arizona Student Ambassador. Ambassadors represent the foundation's mission to end violence. Keely was suggested or selected for her kindness and anti-bullying art mural project that she spearheaded at Vista del Sur in which words of kindness were painted in the bathrooms. Keeley dedicated this project to a friend who committed suicide. 12 News ran a story on this project, which you can watch from Vista's website. Very proud to have Keeley here. And Keeley, would you please come forward uh, right now? And we'll recognize you. Before we uh, move on, if parents, your, your children come up here and you want to come up and get a picture of them, please feel free to do so. Ms. Lotz, we'll get you a picture. Just email Kristen and uh, we'll get that picture to you. Levine School Crossing Guard Daniel Magos was featured on 12 News for his construction of the campus's free little libraries. Mr. Magos designed and built four libraries at Levine and recently completed three more at Trailside Point. Mr. Magos is a staple in the Levine community, a wonderful, wonderful person, having lived here over 40 years. You can watch the video again on our website. And Mr. Magos, would you please come forward? The City of Phoenix Youth and Education Commission is partnering with School Connect and the American Council of Engineering Companies in order to host a STEM cafe. The purpose of the STEM cafe was to bring together STEM schools and the STEM industry 
in order to improve the quality of STEM education for all students. Levine joined two other Phoenix area school districts in hosting STEM professionals at this event. You can see there we have a Rogers Ranch assistant principal, Asia Glover, and STEM teacher, Terry Snow, sharing their school's examples of STEM partnerships. Dr. Roselle, our, our uh, community engagement coordinator, also provided a brief history of STEM cafes. Now, what this resulted in was it uh, yesterday, uh, Rogers Ranch had its career day, and it doubled the amount of engineers that were at that event. And by the way, our very own Dr. Torrance Watkins uh, presented to students at the career day as well. And it also, we have many engineers that they were able to create partners with to come to their May the 4th event, which is a thing, I guess, amongst engineers, but, uh, uh, and in uh, that way they can connect also not just with students, but also with their families. And so uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Gallego was there, uh, Vice Mayor Ansari. It was a wonderful event. And thank you to our, our two staff members. Selling the school, selling our district. Okay, let's uh, have some time for uh, uh, featuring our band program in our district, which is offered at every single one of our schools, uh, funded uh, in large part by our community support through our overrides. We can offer band at all of our schools. In February, uh, 27 students from Vista del Sur, Desert Meadows, Rogers Ranch, Paseo Point, and Chelside Point performed in the Southern Arizona Honor Band in Tucson. Selected students came together to work with selected cl clinicians to prepare music that they performed that same afternoon. Last month, three students from Vista del Sur uh, participated in the Arizona Music, music Educators All-Star Honor Band. This is the most prestigious honor band for middle school band students in the state of Arizona. And they put on a pr fantastic performance. Finally, four EFGA band honor students were selected to participate in the Levine Honor Band. They will be performing at, on April 27th at Barry, Betty Fairfax High School. Now, a long time ago I heard about this, back in February, and I mentioned to Ms. Wolf over at Vista, hey, uh, maybe your students could come and perform at the governing board meeting. Well, we never reconnected, but obviously it stayed in Ms. Wolf's mind and uh, her students' minds. And we are super excited that we have our three students, uh, Nathaniel Sunu, uh, Violet Ackley, and Gabby Sullivan, who are going to perform a piece for us tonight. And so students, please come up. Uh, Ms. Wolf as well.
Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, students. If you please come up here, we'll get a picture with you and families. Again, if you want to come up and get uh, uh, pictures as well, this was awesome. A few nights ago, I had the opportunity to see the great Wynton Marcellus and his band, and they had a trombone, an alto sax, a baritone sax, or tenor sax, and you wonder where those guys were when they were in sixth grade, and, uh, and see where they are now, and so uh, best wishes to you in, in your music uh, pursuits uh, ahead. So you're on a great path. Congratulations to Estrella Foothills fourth grade student, Alric James, who took fifth place in the recent 2023 Arizona State Spelling Bee. Alric was the youngest student to place in the top five of Arizona spellers. He advanced to the state level B after taking first place in the Maricopa County Region 3 Spelling Bee in February. He was also the champion in the Levine School District's B. Let's give Alric a round of applause. Our developmental preschool hosts monthly events for families to join their preschoolers in various activities. Last month, the Arizona Science Center brought their Science on Wheels program to EFGA. Other events have included Goldilocks presented by the Great Arizona Puppet Theater, a trip to the Phoenix Zoo, and as we can see here, a foam party. The last event will be a trip to the Sea Life Aquarium. Thank you to all of our developmental preschool staff uh, for their investment in their children. Congratulations to the Paseo Point Archery Team, which took... We're heavy in uh, Paseo Point tonight. Uh, <laughs> which took second place in the elementary team bullseye and third place in the elementary team 3D. The 3D team, and by the way, 3D means that you're aiming at 3D targets, right? Is that correct, Mr. Roberts? Okay. Animal targets. The 3D team of eight members qualified to go to nationals. The second place team just missed qualifying by 21 points. That's only three arrows. Junior high teams in both events took fifth place, but competition was more challenging and qualifying scores were higher than the elementary category. Six archers placed in the top 10 in their division, which automatically qualifies them for nationals as an individual. Now, first of all, thank you, Mr. Roberts, for spearheading this effort. And I believe... Uh, three of your archers are here tonight. Uh, Joseph Barksdale. There he is, back there. All right. Jeremiah G. Robinson. And Jasmine Holtzclaw.
Uh, best wishes at the next level, students. The Cache neighborhood was selected by the Phoenix Sky Harbor Coalition for a neighborhood cleanup. Because the school served as the staging site for the cleanup, the organization donated $2,500 to the school for the purchase of a memorial bench in Lisa's Corner. EFGA has developed a partnership with Kim Riero, Program Director for Urban Farming Education that has resulted in a pen pal and virtual student exchange program with students in Malawi. Now remember, EFGA is our International Baccalaureate School. Ms. Riero attended the Partnership Summit earlier this year and, and discuss your travels to Malawi and the Likunu Boys Secondary School with Ms. Liebich. They developed the plan of a pen pal and virtual student exchange experience, which led to seventh and eighth graders writing letters to Malawi students hand delivered by Ms. Riero. Riero presented this information to EFGA students about life in, a, in Malawi and what students, what school is like for the students who live there. Students from this school also wrote letters back to our students. This has been an amazing global experience for EFGA students, and the school hopes to continue this exchange of letters and hopefully setting up more virtual meetings as well. Let's give them a round of applause. Rogers Ranch School and Vista del Sur seventh graders recently participated in the Youth Frontiers Courage Retreat. The retreat is put on by Youth Frontiers based out of Minnesota. It provides a day to inspire students to use courage to do the right thing and make responsible decision, the decisions despite their fears. The end goal is for students to learn how to act with courage and to build a positive school culture and climate. The schools also had several student volunteers from Cesar Chavez High School support with small group facilitation. These high school students were chosen by their teachers based on their academic merit, athletic and leadership skills. I had the opportunity to attend the Rogers Ranch uh, event board and I will tell you it was one of the most powerful things I have been to. It was wonderful to see. I was, I was walking on air for the rest of the day. And so uh, thank you uh, to Youth Frontiers and, and Vista and Rogers Ranch for this great event for your students. Let's give them a round of applause. So we have a competitive staff, so it's not kickball. It might end up in kick brawl, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we do have our annual kickball tournament coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, so the annual staff kickball tournament will be taking place on Friday, April 28th from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. There will be plenty of food, drinks, and music provided by our own DJ back in the corner there running the PowerPoint, <laughs> Butch, DJ Butch. And so uh, who, who won this last year, Mr. Thomas? Rogers Ranch. Okay, there you are. Um, and so we'll see what happens uh, this year. I will be hosting two district discussions with Levine families on April 20th. This will be a great opportunity for families to participate in open dialogue with me about Levine's recent demographic study that we'll be presenting tonight, the district signature program, and also answer any questions that our uh, families have. There will be two one-hour sessions trying to meet the needs of people's uh, schedules. Uh, next Thursday, one at 8.30 and one at 5.30 p.m., and they will both be here at the Levine Education Center. Let's move on to our Employees of the Month. Our Certified Employee of the Month is Ginny Major, who is a first grade teacher. All right. Jenny has taught at Paseo Point since 2016. She is known for holding not only her students to a high standard, but herself as well. She constantly strives to reach every student and modifies and adjusts her teaching me methods so that all students achieve success. Outside of the classroom, she, su she supports her students by coaching volleyball, 
and she also attends her students' sporting events on the weekends. Thank you, Jenny, for, your, for supporting your students, your school, and our community, and would you please come forward? First of all, um, you can tell how our students feel about Miss Major's presence on the campus because of that ovation. Not only the students, but the parents who are here tonight. And Miss Major, I can best describe her by her emoji that she had when I started as a principal at the sale point. She had a Garfield emoji, was her emoji. And so her, she's affectionately known as Garfield. But Miss Major is a salt of the earth type of person. And I know she is hating the attention right now. <laughs> because she comes in every day and she just works hard. And she's just a hard worker and she is a teacher that every parent wants because she does an amazing job. And I know the longer I talk, the more uncomfortable she is. So I will let her off the hook, but she's an amazing professional and we are fortunate to have her at Paseo. Thanks, Ms. Major. <laughs> Right. Our classified employee of the month is Maria Eros Mendez, uh, school guest teacher at EFGA. Maria has been in the school uh, guest teacher role since 2017. She is not only a strong support to our students, but to our teachers as well. In her time at Estrella Foothills Global Academy, she has exceeded all expectation. She drives, dives right into covering for absent teachers and does so with a smile and a positive attitude. And if there happens to be a day when she's not assigned to a class, she takes it upon herself to consider the areas of greatest need on campus and offers her support. We are so thankful for your hard work dedica and dedication, Maria. Congratulations, and would you please come forward, Ms. Eric? She is one of those natural teachers. I mean, you go into a classroom and she's just singing. They aren't missing a beat. They, she's up there stretching. She's pulling small groups. She is on it. I believe you like to say she's a natural teacher that you are always on your toes. If there's a day she's not assigned a room, we know she is in her classroom and she's doing it. She just loves it. You have to keep her with a calming speech in there. So you just need to keep it confident. So before we go into classroom spotlight, I know we have a lot of family members that are here tonight to uh, celebrate uh, with their loved ones. And so let's give our family members a round of applause. And now we will 
uh, and friends, I should also say. Uh, and now we will turn over our uh, evening to our classroom spotlight presented by Paseo Point. And Mr. Roloff, thank you for uh, being here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Sprout, uh, President Baragan, uh, Governing Board. Uh, we appreciate you having us. Um, community members, thank you for being here. Um, I'm Jonathan Roloff, the proud principal of Paseo Point. As you can tell, um, they energize me every day coming into school with the excitement for learning that our staff and students have. Um, this is our vision and our mission, which we like to start professional developments and meeting with. And what we really want to focus tonight is our vision, empowering excellence. We have a firm belief that every child that comes through our door is capable of excellence. And it's our job to help them find that and to search that and see it within themselves. Our mission gets a little deeper into how we do that, but we also feel like empowering excellence in our teachers and staff is the foundation for empowering excellence in our students. And as you guys once again can see tonight, from Coach Roberts to Miss Major to the teachers who are going to present to you briefly, we have an amazing staff and walking into Paseo Point every day is an amazing feeling knowing that we have the staff and students and families that we do there. Um, real quick, we're going to talk about number talks tonight, and that's what we're going to demonstrate. And we have a lot of layers. It's not just number talks we're going to be demonstrating tonight, because it's going to be layered in both in Spanish and English. And, um, and we're also going to layer in a Kagan engagement strategy to show the multiple layers that our teachers provide our students. We wanted to correlate it to our learning observation instrument because we feel like this is not just a teacher evaluation tool, but a reflection on excellent in te excellence in teaching when we talk about excellence. So when we talk about the student-to-student -student interaction, this is a way for the students to, be man to have mandatory participation. We want every child to be participating in lessons because the children need to own their education. Um, so when you talk about getting a three or four from the teacher level, that's, that's a good guidepost for us. And you look at some of the components on three with equal participation, application of vocabulary, and justification of ideas, not just what you're learning, but why. Um, and then as you look at instructional approach, you have the top section and the bottom section. And once again, you're talking about the idea of students uh, supporting students and justifying their ideas. So the students are truly responsible for their learning. We want to promote lifelong learning with our students. All right. So I would like to introduce our students and professionals that will be with us tonight. So first of all, um, one of the reasons we chose fourth grade and number talks is last year our fourth grade math really stood out with the 67% passing, and that was really off the charts. And so we, you know, we always want to replicate what, what excellence looks like in classroom. And so our fourth grade team had... Um, had a high degree of excellence, so we wanted to look into it, and number talks is just one of the things they do on a daily basis. So uh, we have a little bit there. Um, Ms. Carlson, who teaches with Ms. Leon, and they're partner teachers, um, so they teach half the day in English and half Spanish together. And then Ms. Bernstein, who is our certified teacher tutor, but does goes to great lengths to support our teachers and work hand in hand with our teachers and bring in lots of strategies that she had um, that she brings to us and to support with learning math. Now the stars of the show are our students. So students, real quick, we want to make sure um, that they're introduced. So we have Jesse's here. Jesse, you want to say hi to everyone? All right. We have Sebastian. Oh, Sebastian didn't make it. I'm sorry. We have Max. Max. All right. We have Hunter. All right, Hunter. Thank you, Hunter. We have Jose. Thank you, Jose. We have Isaac. We have Sammy. And we have Angelo. So what they're going to do is if they will get up and they will come behind you. And what we're going to do is Miss Leon is going to show you, demonstrate a number talk in Spanish. And then the children are actually going to teach you a Kagan strategy for participating in a number talk in English. We'll, we'll bring it back to English so that everybody, it's scaffolded learning for everyone. So, um, Ms. Bernstein, would you like to talk about our standards? Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. I have been teaching at Point for two years. Um, so tonight, uh, the 
standard that our students, I guess I'm speaking to you. The, our, the content standard that our students are looking at is a fourth grade computation standard of multiplication. Um, but as you can see, there are multiple ways to solve a problem, and hopefully you'll see a different strategy tonight than perhaps you've seen in the past. Um, but also, you may or may not know that um, our math standards don't just have content standards. There are also um, standards for mathematical practice, and these are standards where teachers are encouraging our students and really helping our students have habit, the habits of mind of mathematicians. And so these eight standards that are listed here are K-12 standards, and all of our students need to be doing that as they learn to think like mathematicians. Um, tonight, you will highlight, hopefully you'll see some reasoning quantitatively and um, critiquing the reasoning of their peers. They will model with some mathematics, and they will attend to precision, not just in computation, but also in language. <coughs> Can you use the picture? Listos? Okay, ah, un momentito, un momentito, todavía no. Un momentito. Buenas tardes, Presidenta Bergen, Dr. Sprout y miembros de la mesa directiva. Gracias por la oportunidad de presentar esta noche. Thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. Don't worry, it's not all going to be in Spanish. <laughs> um, when we usually begin uh, number talks in the classroom, we review hand signals with our students. So I'm going to go ahead and um, show you the hand signals. Um, Ustedes van a ayudarme, por favor. ¿Cómo enseñas si estás pensando? If you're thinking, what is your hand signal if you're thinking? Muy bien. ¿Cómo pones tu mano si ya tienes una respuesta? If you have an answer. Very good. Uh, si estás de acuerdo con alguien, ¿cuál es la seña? If you're agreeing with someone, there's your hand signal. And if you have more than one strategy, una, dos, tres, depende de cuántas estrategias. Muy bien. Muchas gracias. Um, now I'll go ahead and demonstrate a very short version of the number talks with our fourth graders en español. Muy bien. Vamos a empezar. Ahora vamos a ver este problema. Necesito que por favor resuelvas este problema y pienses en qué estrategia vas a usar. Cuando te termines, por favor, dame tu señal que ya terminaste con tu problema. Ya está escrito, ¿verdad? ¿Cuál es tu señal de que ya está escrito? Gracias, Jesse. Veo que está lista. Veo que también Sammy está lista. También José. Gracias, Max. Ok, vamos a empezar entonces. Vamos a compartir nuestras estrategias que usamos. Um, vamos a ver, Isaac, ¿puedes compartir conmigo cómo resolviste este problema 18 por 27? ¿Qué estrategia usaste? El modelo de área. Oh, veo que también Ángelo y Jesse también y José usaron modelo de área. Excelente, muy bien. Vamos a ver um, otra persona. Hunter, ¿qué estrategia usaste tú? Oh, productos parciales. Muy bien. Gracias. Veo que también otras personas uh, como Sammy usaron productos parciales. Um, gracias a todos. So, that very, very shortened version. Um, and on this side, you can see an example. What usually happens is when they share their strategy with us, as a teacher, we're writing it down on an anchor chart like you see um, on the screen. And so as they're telling us the way that they did it, we'll write their name next to it so that other students can refer to that and say, oh, I did it the way Ariana did, or I did it the way you know Isaac did. And so they have that um, ownership of their work and they're able to have that communication with each other. And if you can see on here, there was a student who did it wrong, uh, the addition part, so the other student was like, well, I agree with the multiplication part, but I don't agree with the adding part because this is what I got. So they, they have those disagreements and they do it in a way where no one's feeling bad and no one is you know, feeling upset or you know, they, they help each other out in the learning process. And you can see also that there's two different strategies that they use to be able to answer. Um, here is an example of student work. Um, we can see that even though two students, you can see right here in these bottom ones, they use the same strategy, which we call area model, you can see the numbers are different on the outside of the area model because um, it demonstrates, um, well, they decompose the numbers to fit their own understanding and their needs, and it demonstrates 
how students can uh, process their own learning as individuals. If they understand conceptually, they can advocate for their learning in multiple ways. So we can see right here, um, this student who it was 18, they did 10 and eight, that's how they decomposed it, yet this student decomposed 18 as nine and nine. And it still gets them to the same answer, they just decompose things in their own way. Um, now you will have an opportunity to participate in a number talk with our fourth grade students. So here's Ms. Carlson, my wonderful partner teacher. Muchas gracias. Good, good evening, thank you, President Bar Berrigan, Dr. Sprout, and the governing board members. Thank you for having us this evening. So before we get started, let's practice the hand signals. So if you are thinking, what hand signal will you use? Okay, if you have a strategy, what hand signal will you use? Very good. And then if you uh, agree with what someone else is saying. Excellent, it looks like we're ready. So then fourth graders, I'm gonna give them the whiteboard and marker if they haven't already. Oh. So then here is your math problem. Um, the students are going to use the Kagan strategy of Rally Coach to help guide you through your learning for today. So the problem is 435 times six. Go ahead. Oh, I don't need that. Nice job. I see that some students have strategies and answers ready. Excellent job. So um, now we're going to share out some of the strategies that you use so I can tell that the governing board's ready. So Dr. Sprout, why don't you share out your strategy that you used? We used the area model. Mm -hmm. I have never used this in my entire there life. There you go. But we took, uh, we took the 435, first we made our, our squares or our rectangle, we put 435, and then we put our six right here, and then we multiplied right and got the product of these two, six times 400 is 2400, and et cetera, et cetera. And then we added it together and we got 2610. Okay, connection symbols, if you also got that answer. Excellent. Did anyone use a different strategy? Hunter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent job. Thank you very much for sharing. So as we had said before, typically students will do this independently and then they'll share out their strategies all together and we'll write that on note paper so that the other students can refer back to those strategies. 
And it helps them being able to discuss their strategies because we know with math that there are so many different ways to get to an answer. Um, in addition, it shows mastery of the standard of 4MBT5 because they're able to multiply the strategies using place value, which in the area model and partial products is really decomposing that 435 into place value. So through number talks, we are essentially giving our students a lot of tools to use, but then they are using the one that works best for them. So thank you very much for the opportunity to let us present. Thank you. Thank you again uh, to Sail Point. Uh, thank you parents for being here tonight and uh, how exciting it is to see our, our students approaching their problem solving in innovative ways. And so uh, it was wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> all right. And these uh, guys are all in my uh, math all-stars club as well, right? So Sail Point is I think number one for, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, before I turn it over to uh, uh, President Berrigan, we do have a couple sports announcements, I think. Uh, on, we just wrapped up our intramural season, and congratulations to the Vista del Sur Tigers girls basketball team for your championship. And, and do we have, uh, are they still playing football out there? Or do we? Oh, there it is, right back there. Ooh, so Cheatham hangs on at the very end. Uh, we, we see you, okay? All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Assistant Principal Francine Tate from Cheatham. So congratulations to Cheatham. And it sounds like we've had great games and a great, uh, great season. So uh, congratulations, schools. Uh, just want to say thank you, everybody, for being here tonight, for sharing your kids with us. Uh, you can see the passion and excitement that the kids and the staff have for Paseo Point. That starts with you, Principal Roloff, and the fact that you believe that every kid can walk in and achieve excellence is an excellent tone to set. We absolutely believe that for every kid in the district, and it's important that the, these kids know we believe that of them at Paseo. Families, thank you for sharing your kids with us tonight. Uh, well, we're going to go to the business portion of our meeting. You're welcome to stay, but we're going to take a brief break just in case you want to exit before we start that part. Thank you.
We're going to reconvene the meeting. Um, next week, we don't have to call for the public here, right? Just at the end. Okay. We have our consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Motion. We've been motion and seconded. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. And for board consideration, we have meal prices for the 23-24 school year. Did you want to, uh, do you have any info on that? We uh, are increasing uh, full price student lunches by 10 cents. That is the minimum that we are allowed to uh, increase uh, based on the calculations from the Arizona Department of Education. So that will go to, from 250 to 260. Breakfasts for our students are free and they will continue to be. And then we're increasing adult breakfasts and lunches by 50 cents. And that's to cover uh, costs uh, associated with. Uh, supplies, food, uh, and staff. Perfect. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. It's been motion and seconded. Any discussion? All. Oh. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay. Uh, we next have the emergency procurement for our broken water uh, pipeline. Uh, this was at Levine Elementary School, and sometimes stuff like this happens. Uh, do I have a motion? Second. It's been motioned and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And then the pay rates for the classified summer school positions. Uh, we see those listed here from cafeteria worker to bus driver and everything in between that keep us going in the summer. Uh, do I have a motion? Motion. It's been motioned and seconded. Any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. I think we skipped something from you. You're right. We did, we did. after the uh, consent agenda. I'm so sorry. Uh, board, on, on the uh, consent agenda, we have a, a new administrator joining our team next year. Our executive, direct, uh, executive director of finance. We're very excited to have her back in Levine uh, from some time away. And that is Ashley Miranda. So congratulations. <laughs> and, and family here as well. So Ashley, we're very excited to, to have you on the team and to bring your expertise. Uh, along with Charlie here, we're going to have a great uh, top team in our, our finance department and business department. So thank you. Thank you. Ashley, will you introduce your family to us? Hi. Hi. Thank you for supporting her. <laughs> okay. We have comments from the board. Linda, you want to go first? We had a great time at uh, Rogers Ranch yesterday. We had a STEM career day. Kids have some interesting questions at first grade about <laughs> They're going to be ready. They're going to be ready. Re ready. How many times did they ask you how much money you make? <laughs> I started off telling them I'd do okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. And then I think on Monday, I'm looking forward to going to uh, Trailside. We're doing a, starting a uh, pre-physicians organization. Seventh and eighth graders from next year. Well, it's testing season, so um, best of luck to all of you guys. You guys are well prepared. There are a lot of great things going on, so just do your best. Very good. My daughter comes home every day and says, we have 13 more tests. And I'm like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> well, let me text somebody. I don't think that's true. <laughs> uh, I just want to say um, many times my comments are, focused at the administration and the excellent work that you guys do. And uh, I continue to believe that and appreciate everything that you do. But I, tonight I want my comments a little bit more centered around my fellow board members. Um, there are a lot of boards in the Maricopa County in the state of Arizona um, and in the US as a whole that are um, in disarray. They have allowed politics to become more important than the work of a governing board, which is to support the students and the community in a school district, and we have not done that. 
not through COVID, not since COVID. And I'm extremely proud of you guys. And I know, Linda, you'll continue in that vein with us um, as a new board member. But uh, just want to say how proud I am of you guys. So. Uh, OK, we have the call to the public regarding non-agenda items. And we do have one this evening. I'm just going to read a statement first. The call to the public is on the regular board agendas to provide everyone the opportunity to be heard. The governing board understands the importance of communication with the public and welcomes and values your comments, concerns, input, and praise. The governing board cannot comment or answer issues brought up at call to the public because only items listed on the agenda for discussion or action may be addressed. This does not mean that your comments will be forgotten or that the board does not care what you think. The board uh, president will discuss with the superintendent and every effort will be made to answer your questions or resolve your concerns. Thank you for caring about the children of the Levine Elementary School District and for taking time out of your busy schedule to address the board. Uh, tonight we have a Mr. Antonio Rodriguez that wants to speak. If you can come on up, um, state your name and uh, please share with us. Hello. Uh, my name is Antonio Rodriguez, um, and this is just, you know, to just to notify you guys. Um, so my daughter attends Rogers Ranch Elementary during the 2021-2022 school year. My daughter was in the fifth grade. Her teacher was Victoria Kaus. Victoria Kaus no longer teaches in your school district. In uh, late October of 2022, I found out through court filings that my daughter had allegedly wrote notes while in Victoria's class, alleging that I was abusive to my daughter and that my daughter wanted to run away from my home. These notes were dated as far back as December of 2021, and I was barely finding this out. Over the past one and a half years, I have been involved in a high conflict custody case. Through these court filings, I found out Victoria colluded with my ex to get her these notes so that my ex could then use these against me in court. In order to accomplish this, Victoria broke Rogers Ranch School policy and Arizona state law as a mandated reporter. Victoria then went on to testify against me in court. While she was supposed to be teaching students at her new school, she took her phone out during class to begin her testimony with kids in clear view of her camera. In her ruling, the judge referred to Victoria's testimony and the notes she provided as the saddest part, giving this great weight. As a result, the majority of my parenting time was taken away and my ex got final say regarding decision-making rights. I went from having 50-50 to only seeing my daughter every other weekend. And had Victoria reported these notes to DCS, there would have been a months long investigation of evidence and interviews with everyone involved. What Victoria didn't know is that I had been accused fictitiously of abuse in the past and those claims were found unsubstantiated by DCS. Victoria also didn't know that I had proof my ex would coach my daughter to not say nice things about me. That a judge had minutes to make a rushed call. Please note that Victoria Cows could still be sitting on reports from other children from Rogers Ranch and this is per her text in a squirrel habit, and I, um, and I quote, in a squirrel habit, I took this away in a journal and just found it. Can this be submitted as evidence? She goes on to say, I usually kept teacher mail to myself since kids usually disclose this kind of stuff, end quote. And she was referring to allegations of abuse. I want to see this district make it a priority to uh, remind staff of their legal responsibilities and to remind them that policy and law are drafted for a reason. And when this is not adhered to, that staff member could fall for lies and manipulation, lending themselves to the destruction of an innocent family I want this board to reassure the parents who send their kids to your schools that those kids are being protected and that the concerns they report are being handled in accordance to policy and law. Victoria has also been texting my daughter since she was 11 years old. Uh, she's also been texting other young students from Rogers Ranch as well. And I would hope that you looked into this. I have communicated to her and notified her new principal, her new superintendent and her new district board that she needs to stop communicating with my daughter because she does not have my permission to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Okay, we uh, our next meeting is on May 11th, 2023, right here. In the meantime, let's adjourn this meeting so we can go into our study session. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. It's been motion and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. And now we have the applied demographics, or excuse me, applied economics demographic reports. Dr. Sprout. Thank you, President Berrigan. Tonight, I will be providing you with the first overview of our recent demographic and enrollment analyses completed by Applied Economics. My pre <clears throat> presentation is taken from a 41-page report, which we provided to you. And during this presentation, we will look at historical data, as well as projections through the 2032-33 school year, 10 years from now. We'll, I'll refer to that as the projection uh, period. Uh, 
As this is a study session, please feel free to ask questions as we go through the slide deck. I will uh, do my best to answer them. Uh, we also have Kevin Hegarty here on the line, our CFO, and, and uh, he will also be doing a follow-up presentation on this in May as well. Before we start, a huge thanks to our data analyst, analyst coordinator, Catherine Crary, for her help with slides. And also, I was just thinking, as we are in testing season, you should know Catherine is responsible for all things state testing, from training to the occasional, very extremely, extremely rare testing violation. Uh, next week is one of Catherine's busy weeks, and then she will be processing the results as they are returned in May. So thank you, Catherine, for all you are doing. Back to our study. 10 aspirations guide us in carrying out our crucial role of educating children. And the demographic and enrollment study ties into all of our aspirations and is particularly pertinent to three aspirations. First, we at Community Choice, we aspire to be and arguably provide the best educational options for pre-K through eighth grade children in Levine. And this demographic study helps us to make sure we understand our community, particularly with respect to growth and how we continue to, how we can continue, continue to be the best option for all children. Secondly, stewardship. We seek to maximize our resources and knowing our growth projections will help us determine our future staffing, land acquisition, new schools, and other capital and curricular need, uh, needs to name a few. Next, advocacy. We seek to advocate for the community we serve. And the more we know about our future, the better we can pursue what's best for our district, which equates to what's be best for our students, our families, our staff, and the Levine community as a whole. As I said, there's gonna be two parts of this. One is historic and, I, actually I didn't say this, but we're gonna have a historic portion and then projections looking forward. So let's start with a historical look at our demographics and enrollment. <clears throat> we begin with enrollment history based on 40th day enrollment. Focusing on the blue bars, which correspond to the y-axis on the left, you can see that with the exception of the pandemic-induced loss of enrollment in 2021, our enrollment has increased every year since the 2002-03 school year. Now, focusing on the red line, you can see that the percent change in enrollment from year to year, uh, you can see the percent change in enrollment from year to year with our hyper growth that we experienced in 2002 through three through 2007, eight school years, and then the relatively stable growth since then, hovering right at zero and 5%. Now, what I'd like to do is zoom in on the past four years. <clears throat> you can see that in the 2021 school year, during the pandemic, we lost 5% of our enrollment. We came within two students of returning to pre-pandemic numbers in 2021-22. And then we increased by 5.6% from 21, from last year, 21-22, to this year. What that basically equates is a 5.6% growth from 1920 to 2223. All in all, we have in, we have recovered enrollment wise from the negative effects of the pandemic and according to our demographer, we have been blessed with a better recovery than most school districts. Now let's look at our enrollment density. This is current. Our enrollment density varies significantly throughout the district going from low density in blue to high density in red. Overall, we have mostly lower levels of growth, uh, of, I'm sorry, of density in the southern half of the district. By the way, the top side of this rank, uh, rectangle is basically about uh, South Mountain Avenue. 
above South Mountain Avenue, we see higher denser, densities, and we will re revisit this once we get into projections. But that's where things are as of now, today, the 22-23 school year. This slide shows the geographic distribution of our current students, so another way of looking at enrollment density. Once again, enrollment is concentrated in the north half of our district. Now let's zoom in a little bit closer, and you can see where our out-of-district <coughs> students are predominantly found, and that would be just east of our district boundary and in the areas north of the district and adjacent to Loop 202. Regarding in and out of, uh, and out of district students, in 2022-23, 16.5% of our district enrollment came from outside of the district's boundaries. This is an increase from 2017-18 when 11.2% of our students came from outside the district. And you can see that that percentage increases every year, including the pandemic where we saw, and including in the pandemic where we saw an actual increase in out of district students. Over the past five years, district enrollment has increased by 835 students, with 61% of those coming from outside of the district. In other words, our out of district enrollment increases have outpaced our in district increases. Here is a closer look at a, a historic look at out of district enrollment by the district source. And we'll pull it in a little bit closer for, and if your eyes are blurry, that's, that's the slide, it's okay? That's not your <laughs> eyes, actually. Uh, but you can see uh, for this school year, uh, uh, the source of our, the top sources of our out of district students. Another way to look at our enrollment history is by grade level cohorts, K through second, third through fifth, and sixth through eighth. The district is somewhat unique according to our demographer in that the cohorts have remained very similar in size over time. The exception was in 2020-21 and uh, during the pandemic, and let's zoom in here on the right, so I've expanded that that section there, where the effects of the pandemic on enrollment were strongest in the youngest cohorts, causing average enrollment in the K-2 cohort to decline by 8.6%, compared to 2 to 3% decline in the other cohorts. And believe me, that was a point of discussion uh, on, on our team uh, and a concern. Since then, so that, that's, that's basically that, those gaps, that purple line there. Since then, enrollment in the K-2 cohort has grown the fastest, increasing by roughly 7% in each of the past two years. And now our cohorts are back to being roughly equal at approximately 2,500 students each. Now let's step away from uh, enrollment and take a look at our community at large. The population of people within the boundaries of the Levine School District has increased from 8,850 to 40,902 between 2010, and then increased by just over 13,000 people from 2010 to 2020. So you can see the, the, the hyper growth between 2000 and 2010, slowing down a little bit between 10 and 20. Likewise, in housing, uh, in housing unit, the increase in housing units was 16.5% per year, per year, between 2000 and 2010. 
And then, as uh, you can see, uh, and matching with the population, there was a slowdown between 2010 and 2020, which corresponded to slower uh, population growth in our community. Of the 13,100 housing units added to the inventory since 2000, virtually all of them were single family. And we have seen an increase in rentals as well. So follow the renter from 14.2 to 19.1 to 26.4. Over the last 20 years, this has occurred. And then the other interesting uh, aspect of our community is that multifamily units in 2020 comprise just 1% of the total housing in the district. And we know that's going to change. And I'll talk with you about that in just a moment. By the way, I just have to say, I, I didn't emphasize this, but we had 8,000 people in this community 23 years ago. And, and now we are uh, you know, up over 54,000. So amazing growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's another way of looking at it, yeah. Although there has been relatively little change, sorry, there we go. Although there has been relatively, we're now looking at uh, demographic trends by race and ethnicity. Although there has been relatively little change in the racial makeup of the district's population since 2010, Substantial changes occurred between 2000 and 2010. Most notably, the share of white and Hispanic persons declined from a combined total of 94% in 2000 to 74% in 2010. And the share of African American persons de increased from 2.6 to 17%. Here is the 2020 breakdown, reinforcing the incredible diversity of our community. Information on householder ages is useful in predicting the potential for school-aged children. The combined share of the 35 to 44 and 45 to 55 year age cohorts is now 48.5%, up from 40.6%, in 2010. This is important because the 35 to 44 and 45 to 54 year age cohorts are generally considered to be the most significant cohorts in determining school age po uh, population. The other positive sign, of course, is right above that with our 25 to 34 age population uh, being at 20%. Now we're looking forward to the next 10 years. The district's population is expected to increase by 40% during uh, this period, adding 23,000 people to total 81,000 people in Levine by 2032-33. Currently, the district, oh, there's, there's that, I forgot <laughs> to click there. And currently, uh, the district has approximately 18,000 housing units, up nearly 800 units, or 5% from last year. Recent housing additions in the district have been exceptionally strong. We do expect slowing in the next year, but then new additions are expected to accelerate again, adding nearly 4,100 units during the first five years of our projection period. Another 2,900 units are expected to be added during the second five-year period, bringing the total to approximately 7,000 new units by 2032-33. And I think that's where I threw in this uh, crucial piece of information about the changing of our community, and that is they now expect 25% of new builds, new units, to be multifamily in Levine. Uh, and that takes everything from condominiums to uh, rent to uh, 
communities uh, that, where you basically, they look like neighborhoods, but they're all rentals, um, mm -hmm. which we have near Betty Fairfax. Um, and, and so uh, we will see a dramatic increase in multifamily. And I know everyone is sitting on their seats, waiting for this. Uh, I sense it to my left. Everyone's just super excited. I'm not looking over there, but I can feel it coming. What are our enrollment projections going forward? And so I have a complex uh, slide here for you that I will walk you through. Sorry for all the small numbers, but. So our study predicts that we will see an increase in the school age population living in Levine of 3,615 students in the next 10 years, going from 9411 to 13,026. So that's our uh, school age population, okay? Our study also predicts that we will see an increase in enrollment of 2,301 students in the next 10 years, from 75-75 to 98-76, or a 30% increase. This number includes in and out of school district students. So you may be asking, why are the numbers you see circled in blue more than the numbers in red? And that answer is due to the historical and projected enrollment to population ratio, or EP ratio. This ratio is based on the difference between the school age population and the total enrollment. Acknowledging that there are flows of students, there are students that are in our school age population in Levine that will not go to a Levine school, and there are students uh, in source districts that will be coming to our school. We can also look at our projected enrollment from a service rate perspective, which is the percent of students from within our district boundaries that are enrolled in our schools. Both the district's EP ratio and service rate have increased recently, which is a positive indicator of satisfaction with district schools. This is one of the most key moments of the presentation. Our demographer predicts that competition from alternative providers is likely to increase during the projection period. As a result, they place both ratio or both ratios are expected to trend downward over the next 10 years. Assuming out of district enrollment increases gradually, these projections show an EP ratio of 75.8% and a service rate of 63% in 2032-33, resulting in a total enrollment of approximately 9,800 students at the end of this projection period. This represents, again, an increase of 30% or 2,300 students compared to 22-23. Now I know when I saw that, I know what you're thinking, I know what you all are thinking, is that EP ratio and service ratio healthy? Are, are those numbers okay? And I did speak with our demog demographer, of course, I couldn't help myself, and was provided uh, with comparison elementary school districts. And I will tell you our numbers are really really good. So uh, if you're wondering, uh, I think there would be a lot of districts that would enjoy having that EP ratio and that service rate. So mm -hmm. that was a moment. This next chart represents the data table in the previous slide, showing with the blue bars the projected school age population and the red bars showing the projected uh, uh, actual enrollment. Both are increasing over the next 10 years, despite a gradually declining green line EP ratio during that same time period. Annual enrollment increases are expected to be stronger during the first five years of our projection period, averaging 3.5% per year or 1,400 students and an average enrollment increase of 1.9% or 900 students is expected during the second half of the projection period. Again, adding up to approximately 2,300 more, more students 
in the next 10 years. Another piece of good projection news is that the distribution of students among the grade cohorts is expected to remain nearly unchanged over the next 10 years, which is an encouraging sign of enrollment being at least stable between, uh, beyond the 2032-33 school year. <clears throat> Going back to this picture, uh, this representation of our district shows where we expect to see increases in enrollment going from the blue areas which show a decrease to a red, the red areas which show an increase. With an increase of approximately 2,300 students, we are planning on building two new schools and in the next, next month, our CFO, Kevin Hagerty, will be discussing all things future with the board, whether it is schools, land, or other infrastructure needs based on this data. So what are our key takeaways? First of all, this study gives us a 10-year uh, research-based foundation for planning the future of this district. We didn't know going into this study when Levine was going to level. Uh, it's been something that we've been wondering about for a while, uh, but this does show us some very encouraging news that our district will be growing for the next 10 years. This study fortifies the importance of the Levine School District being the leader in delivering the best educational opportunities to every, every, every child who lives in this community and to be the number one option in an era of open enrollment in Arizona. One way we can do this in addition to teaching our core subjects and special area classes with excellence to all students who walk through our doors is to provide our own in-district choices to our community through our signature programs at every school. Next, we can also expect that the Levine School District will continue to be an attractive option for out-of-district students and families. Our reputation is growing and our results speak for themselves. Our employees make it possible and we must also continue to strive to provide our employees with a place to make an impact, to give them the support they need, to give them opportunities for advancement, to compensate them and give them the best benefits that we can do in a fiscally uh, accountable way, and celebrate their dedicated and outstanding work. We can't do it without it. We see time and time again the greatness of the Levine School District, which starts with our community to our elected by the community governing board and through our staff and parents and ultimately ensures the future success of our students. While our theme this year is find greatness here, I know that the board and I have no doubt that this theme will continue in the years to come. And that concludes our first look at our data, our demographic and enrollment analysis. Thank you for that, Dr. Sprout. That was very comprehensive and even further, we have a 41 page report to review. Um, and the information in there is actually fantastic. It, what? We're gonna look at it all. I gotta look at my district, 70 pages. So 40 is nothing. Um, it's great information, guys. You should all look at it. <laughs> they got a copy. I told them okay. there would not be a test. Okay. So uh, okay. we're not testing on it. Yeah. Um, you know, I you had a lot of key takeaways in there, and I think for me, my key takeaway, um, I, I I I love Rick and I he does a great job. I think he may be a little overly pessimistic in how many charter schools are going to open within our boundaries. Charter schools like to open when they um, feel like they can compete, and I'm not sure that they believe they can compete with our district right now, and I hope that that will continue because we have incredible things happening every day because of those employees that make it um, a, a wonderful district. 
uh, also is evidenced by the increasing number of students that come to us from out of district. So um, really happy to see that information. Uh, every district I can think of would kill for a demographic report that looks like this, not just the growth that we have coming, um, and, but also the number of students that they're pulling from other districts and bringing back from other schools. So very pleased to see that information. I don't have any questions. Board members, do you guys have any comments or questions that you want to share? Okay, I'm going to quiz you all next time, okay? <laughs> Read your 41 pages. <laughs> okay, I think that's all we have, right? Okay, so, thanks everybody. Right, thank have you. a good night.